Welcome everybody to Reading the Bible to Cats. Guster is on top of a box. <laughs> I I know I've talked about this a ton, but I have so many boxes and the kitties love the boxes. Like I said, I thought I was moving, but I'm actually not now, so not for a while. So I'm going to either have to unpack the boxes or get a storage unit for the boxes. <laughs> Because it's not, you know, feasible to keep on living with just these boxes like this stacked up. But the kitties love it because they love to play on the boxes. They love to jump in the boxes. They just love the boxes. Anyway, before we start, I wanted to share these books. Um, and I don't have any stake in these books at all. but they have been a comfort to me and I know you know some of you have lost your kitties and some of you are losing your kitties and I just want you to know my heart goes out to you and I, I just know that pain and it's so hard but here are some books that comforted me I can't say I've read them cover to cover but I like I've opened them and they've been a comfort you know in terms of what I've read Here's one. I showed this the other day. It's called There is Eternal Life for Animals, a book based on Bible scripture by Nikki Burkus Shanahan. And here's another one. Animals. Oops, sorry. Can't show this to you. All. Animals, Immortal Beings, Scriptural Evidence of the Immortality of Animals. Edited and with commentary by Mary Buttemeyer Porter, author of Will I See Fido in Heaven? And that's the cover. Okay. And this is Will I See Fido in Heaven? By a scripturally revealing God's wonderful eternal plan for his non-human creatures. By Mary Buttemeyer Porter. Sorry, you're not getting the full picture of the covers. And then this one is by Gary Kurtz. Cold Noses at the Pearly Gates. A Book of Hope for Those Who Have Lost a Pet. Um, yeah. Cold Noses at the Pearly Gates. And then this one I haven't really read, but I think it's an old book. It's The Immortality of Animals and the Relation of Man as Guardian by Elijah D. Buckner. So for those of you who um, are missing your kitties or your kitties are getting ready to return to their creator and designer, I, you know, t I hope you take comfort in at least um, knowing that, that there are books out there for you and that God loves your kitties. I mean, he that that passage, not a sparrow falls to the ground apart from the Father, always comforts me. It's like their days are are ordained as well. Okay, uh, now let's re jump into um, Numbers chapter nineteen. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is a requirement of the law that the Lord has commanded. Tell the Israelites to bring you a red heifer without defect or blemish, and that has never been under a yoke. Give it to Eleazar the priest. It is to be taken outside the camp and slaughtered in his presence. Then Eleazar the priest is to take some of its blood on his finger and sprinkle it seven times toward the front of the tent of meeting. While he watches, the heifer is to be burned, its hide, flesh, blood, and intestines. The priest is to take some cedar wood, hyssop, and scarlet wool and throw them onto the burning heifer. After that, the priest must wash his clothes and bathe himself with water. He may then come into the camp, but he will be ceremonially unclean till evening. The man who burns it must also wash his clothes and bathe with water. 
and he too will be unclean till evening. A man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and put them in a ceremonially clean place outside the camp. They are to be kept by the Israelite community for use in the water of cleansing. It is for purification from sin. The man who gathers up the ashes of the heifer must also wash his clothes, and he too will be unclean till evening. This will be a lasting ordinance both for the Israelites and for the foreigners residing among them. Whoever touches a human corpse will be unclean for seven days. They must purify themselves with water on the third day and on the seventh day. Then they will be clean, but if they do not purify themselves on the third and seventh days, they will not be clean. If they fail to purify themselves after touching a human corpse, they defile the Lord's tabernacle. They must be cut off from Israel because the water of cleansing has not been sprinkled on them. They are unclean. Their uncleanness remains on them. This is the law that applies when a person dies in a tent. Anyone who enters the tent and anyone who is in it will be unclean for seven days, and every open container without a lid fastened on it will be unclean. Anyone out in the open who touches someone who has been killed with a sword or someone who has died a natural death or anyone who touches a human bone or a grave will be unclean for seven days. For the unclean person... Put some ashes from the burned purification offering into a jar and pour fresh water over them. Then a man who is ceremonially clean is to take some hyssop, dip it in the water, and sprinkle the tent and all the furnishings. And the people who were there, he must also sprinkle anyone who has touched a human bone or a grave or anyone who has been killed, or anyone who has died a natural death. The man who is clean is to sprinkle those who are unclean on the third and seventh days, and on the seventh day he is to purify them. Those who are being cleansed must wash their clothes and bathe with water, and that evening they will be clean. But if those who are unclean do not purify themselves, they must be cut off from the community because They have defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. The water of cleansing has not been sprinkled on them, and they are unclean. This is a lasting ordinance for them. The man who sprinkles the water of cleansing must also wash his clothes, and anyone who touches the water of cleansing will be unclean till evening. Anything that an unclean person touches becomes unclean. And anyone who touches it becomes unclean till evening. Okay, that's the end of Numbers 19. I think the thing that stands out, well, the red heifer stands out, but also clean and unclean and how, you know, if you touch something unclean, then you're unclean and then you have to be cleansed. But it reminds me of of Jesus, you know, because he touched the lepers they were unclean but he didn't become unclean he made them clean so he's he's like the cleanser you know it also reminds me of when he was i think speaking to his disciples and he said um you are clean because of the word i have spoken to you i think that's what he said meaning his word just cleanse them There's just this theme of clean and unclean, but with Jesus, you know, who, whomever he touches becomes clean and whoever, you know, takes his, his word, takes him at his word is cleansed by his word. I think that's interesting. And then the, the red heifer and that that's so prophetic, you know, because it's the the red heifer, the ashes of the red heifer and the water, um, you know, were used in in this cleansing um, procedure. But if I'm not mistaken, well, the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., and so there's never been a need for a red heifer, uh, you know, and 
over 2,000 years because there's no temple and the Levitical system is not in place anymore for the Jewish nation or the Jewish people. But because of that, but, you know, I've said it before, and some of you may have visited Israel and the Temple Institute. You know, there's there are people who want to see, of course, the temple rebuilt and that for the Levitical system to be in place because it's, um, you know, but but they would need a red heifer. And apparently there ha it's, it's exceptionally hard to find an unblemished red heifer without defect. And I think they've been trying to find a red heifer and you know, that's completely red. Like it can't have any white hairs or black hairs apparently. And, um, I think there are, I think, they have been able to procure red heifers now, if I'm not mistaken, which is pretty prophetic because that would um, then be used for the cleansing of, of the temple. And anyway, if any of you know anything about that, you can put it in the comments below and let me know. Okay, well, let's move on to the... Um, Romans chapter 3. I'm excited to be in Romans. Boy, Guster is so black. You just He just looks like a little black pom-pom or something. <laughs> just, a little black shiny hat. Or he, you just can't see his features or anything other than his little toenails. Little claws there. Okay, well, let's read Romans 3. Sorry, I'm sighing a lot. I think I'm tired. You know, COVID, I'm so much better, but I think COVID kind of made me a little tired. Okay, Romans 3. What advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. What if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar, as it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? that God is unjust and bringing his wrath on us? I'm using a human argument. Certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as some slanderously claim that we say, well, let us do evil, that good may result. Their condemnation is just. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all, for we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin, as it is written. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious 
of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate His righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Okay, everyone, that's the end of Romans 2, I mean 3. Woo, there, this one is, it's so rich theologically. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I say oh my gosh a lot. I learned that um that phrase oh my gosh from a little lady in a retirement home who uh, I was walk rounding the corner and she was rounding the corner in her wheelchair and she said oh my gosh cuz I startled her. But anyway, that was years and years ago and I've never stopped saying it since she said it that day. But um anyway, that was random. Rando. Um, but yeah, Romans 3 is so rich theologically, but and it's so refreshing too because, you know, we're reading through the law, we're reading numbers, and, you know, it's heavy. And he's, you know, making his case for faith and grace. Um, you know, through Jesus Christ and and His atoning work and the and the blood that sprinkles us clean and redemption that came by Christ um, through the shedding of His blood to be to be received by faith. It, it's just there's so much in this chapter. It's like. I could just probably read it over and over and then hope that it sinks in. <laughs> Cause it's just, for some reason, it just feels so, um, so, so dense, you know, in a good way, like dense with, with insight. Um, yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it's, we're justified by faith. In, in Jesus. It, it's that righteousness doesn't come through the law. But then at the end he says, do we nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. I mean, because it's, it's a fulfillment of the law. You know, the faith in Christ and, and what Christ has done for us. You know, since he really is the personification of the law because he's God. Um, I don't know. It's just there's a lot there. But anyway, it's, it's through through faith. You know, it's like I can say these things, but it's like, oh, I need all this to really sink into my heart. Hmm. So these are foot. The, there are several footnotes. Um. Paul has, in that passage, Romans 3, he cited several Old Testament passages. I'll name them for you. 
he cited Psalm 51 verses 4, Psalms 14 one, verses 1 through 3, Psalm 53 verses 1 through 3, Ecclesiastes 720, Psalm 5 verse 9, Psalm 140 verse 3, Psalm 10 verse 7, Isaiah 59 verses 7 and 8, and Psalm 36 verse 1. Wow, he cited a lot of the Psalms. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven Psalms. He cited Isaiah. Interesting. Okay. Oh, and then there's a little note here. Romans 3.25. Here, I'll just read this little note. The Greek for sacrifice of atonement refers to the atonement cover on the Ark of the Covenant. See Leviticus 16, verses 15 and 16. Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. Okay, everyone. There you have it. Faith. Gotta have faith. And then, of course, faith is a gift from God as well. It's like he gives us the gift of faith. And he says, even if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, seed we can move mountains but then you know he gives us that faith but we have to i don't know grow in it mature in it sometimes faith feels i could be totally off here correct me if i'm wrong but kind of feels like a muscle like you have to use it in order for that faith to grow um yeah okay what is that other verse? Um, faith is faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I like that. The gift of faith. Um, Guster is snoring. <laughs> well, let's say a prayer. Lord, thank you for your word. Help that you know, your word to sink into my heart in a way that, um, you know, just kind of would work in me and help to change me and grow my faith. Oh, yeah, it reminds me of that verse, um, faith comes by hearing the word. So, yeah. Lord, I pray for... Um, my YouTube friends and for any of them who are suffering a loss, a, a loss of a kitty or a, a sick kitty, um, just pray that you comfort them and assure their hearts that you love them and, and all the kitties that you've created and love, that you love your creation more than we, we can. Pray for comfort, and I pray uh, that you bless them and put your loving arms around them and their and their kitties or their their furry loved ones. I pray also for um, the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Israel. I haven't been watching the news so I'm not up on what's going on but we just pray that you bring peace Lord because you call us to pray for that and also pray for um, the animals there and any any suffering animals um, in Gaza Lord or anywhere where they're suffering in the world in Ukraine wherever and we ask that you, uh, we know that you care for them, too. Pray for the hostages, that you would free them. Pray for any um, people in, in Gaza that need you to show up and reveal yourself to them and redeem them and help them, Lord. Pray for the Palestinian Christians. Protect them from Hamas. Pray for the world. It's it's a it's a rough time, and 
Even the sea is roaring and raging right now in certain parts of the world in California. We just um, know that we need to look up and trust you. We pray for your love, your joy, and your peace. And your joy is our strength. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everybody. I don't know why when I close, I was like, all right, everybody, with a funny accent, but it just happens. I can't help it. I like to talk funny sometimes. I don't know why. Okay. All right. I'm going to go now. Good night. Uh, it's nighttime for me, but it might be morning for you. Um, it is Saturday night and tomorrow Sunday. So, yeah. oh my goodness. So I'm going to be posting this on New Year's Eve. So, Happy New Year's. All right, 2024. I'll see you. I'll see you in 2024. All right, bye.